We have five topics on today's show compared to our normal three, but the show will still be the same amount of time, 25 to 30 minutes. Your version of the University of Texas meat sandwich on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns. You are Locked on Longhorns, your daily podcast on the Texas Longhorns. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Locked on Longhorns, the show. Jonathan Davis, your host. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your your first purchase. As previously mentioned, we normally do three segments or three topics on the show. Today we're doing five. Right? I didn't do an episode yesterday. Don't plan on doing an episode on Saturday or Sunday unless Texas beats Houston. I might come out here and say a few words. So wanted to get out as much as I can on today's episode of Locked on Longhorns. Those five topics are going to be uh, some key position battles going into the spring and ultimately into the 2024 season for the football team. Second topic, 11 Texas Longhorn players have been invited to the NFL Combine. Third topic, CDC had some very interesting comments at his press conference this week. I discussed my favorite ones. Fourth topic, NCAA 25 has now been confirmed to be released this summer after being gone for over 10 years in the Sarkeesian era, who would have been the highest rated players on the game. And then last but not least, the Texas basketball team has a chance to pick up their biggest win of the season. If they can beat the Houston Cougars in Houston tomorrow at noon central, all of that and more on today's episode of locked on Longhorns, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. Day. So once again, five topics, same amount of time, 25 to 30 minutes. Didn't do a show yesterday. Don't plan on doing a show tomorrow or a Sunday. I plan on enjoying my weekend. So I wanted to get as much content out as I could today, especially with a lot of things going on around the, the program recently or just things we can tie to the program like NCAA 25 coming out in the summer. So the first thing is position battles. I was on Inside Texas looking at some articles and I think on Valentine's Day, they had wrote an article talking about some of the five most intriguing battles on this Texas football team. And one of the interesting things they wrote was that, uh, you know, the last few years we've kind of, especially last year, like going into the season, I think we pretty much knew who our starters were going to be, right? Like there were a few positions where, you know, maybe it was up for grabs, but for the most part going into last season, we had a pretty good idea of who our 22 starters were going to be. I think this year there's a little more, I don't want to say uncertainty, Right. Because that sounds like a bad thing. And we have way too much talent on this roster for position battles to be a bad thing. But I think going into this season, there's more opportunity for those people that are second on the depth chart to move up and take that spot. Right. So we're going to talk about five positions that could be interesting going into the spring and then ultimately into the season. And this is from Inside Texas, once again, written on Valentine's Day. So the first one is left guard. Right. And that's going to be a very interesting battle between Cole Hudson and and Big Nita, right? I've been saying it for years. I don't want to butcher his last name. Nothing's changed in 2024, right? And so when we look at Cole Hudson, um, he has experience at left and right guard. He started as a true freshman, played a lot of snaps last year, right? Splitting time between him and uh, DJ Campbell. And then this year he was in more of a reserve role, but he has played three years at the guard position for the University of Texas. While Big Nita, who's you know been in the same recruiting class, has always been kind of uh, that would it right a really athletic player that you know started to get some more burn last year and I think with the opportunities he got coming in he showed that he could be a viable guard for this football team but we've recruited the offensive line so well and we've developed the offensive line so well under Kyle Flood especially taking players that were holdovers from the previous administration and turning them into really good players on this offensive line that all of this debt that we've recruited and developed hasn't been able to show itself up on the field just yet right that's why a player like big nito who has taken so many strides since he got here on campus and would start for most teams in the country is still somewhat even in his junior year buried on the depth chart and i think when you look at uh this battle going into next year right you know that dj campbell is going to be at right guard and you know that hayden connor more than likely is going to move to right tackle so that opens up a void at left guard to me i'm giving the edge to cole hudson because he has that three years of experience i understand the upside with big nito right the athleticism and what he could potentially do at that guard position but i've said it a million times on this podcast i think 2024 is somewhat of a make or break year for the texas longhorns 
to me, right, we need to go out and prove that 2023 was not a fluke and we are ready to compete at a high level in the SEC to shut up the naysayers and to continue to prove to recruits that Texas is the destination to be, right? And to do that, I think you need to lean on experience, lean on what you know you have. And Cole Hudson has been a really good player for you for three years at the 48s, right? Of course, you know, they have to compete. Iron sharpens iron. And if Big Nito wins the battle, then he wins the battle and he'll be your starter going into the season. But I think with the experience edge and what we've seen from Cole Hudson on the field, my nod would be going to Cole Hudson going into the 2024 season. The next battle we want to talk about is right tackle, right? And this is going to be very interesting because Kristen Jones is moving on to the National Football League. He has been, um, you know, your tackle on the right side uh, the last two years. And now you're going to have to replace him, right? And the two prime candidates are – uh, Cam Williams, who will be a true junior. We haven't seen a bunch of him. And Hayden Connor, who has been your left guard for the last couple of years. And the reason that they are talking about moving Hayden Connor to right tackle instead of keeping him at left guard, where he played really well last year, especially down the stretch, is because they don't believe that he is I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. He is maybe not a plus player in the run game at that position. Right. I think he's a really good pass blocker. I think he's a serviceable run blocker. But in terms of being a plus player in terms of run blocking, going against defensive tackles, that's not his strength. Right. I think the Texas staff looks at it and sees him as somebody who would be better suited playing against smaller defensive ends than 320 to 350 pound defensive tackles that can blow you off the line of scrimmage. Right. And then you look at Cam Williams who is huge, right? He's a mammoth of a prospect, 350, 360 pounds, and somebody who can absolutely maul people in the run game. But you do have questions about somebody that big, right? Is he nimble enough to play the tackle position? Is he agile enough to play the tackle position? Does he move his feet well enough to play the tackle position? So you're looking at Hayden Connor moving to right tackle, who should be really good in pass protection, but maybe you're questioning how dominant he'll be in the run game. Whereas it's kind of the inverse with Cam Williams, right? You really have no questions about what he'll be able to come in and do in the run game, but you have questions about how he'll be able to hold up on that right side against some of those more athletic and speedy young defensive ends, right? And once again, I think that you should lean on the experience, right? We've seen Hayden Connor as a starter on this offensive line for the last few years. He's gotten better almost game to game, it seems like. And this is going to be a huge year for Steve Sarkeesian, this offense, but Quinn Ewers in his passing game, right? I think we have two really talented running backs, really a stable of really talented running backs. But I think we're going to lean on the passing game. And this is Quinn Ewers' year to show that he's one of the most talented quarterbacks in the country and he can be a franchise quarterback in the National Football League. We've also seen that at times Quinn Ewers can be a different quarterback under pressure, right? No surprise there. Most quarterbacks are, especially young quarterbacks. I don't want Quinn Ewers this year worrying about his protection on the right side, right? I don't want Quinn Ewers this year running for his life or not being comfortable in the pocket because he doesn't trust Cam Williams to pass protect, right? I think both are very good players, but here I'm leaning on experience and I'm leaning on the player that is better in pass protection. And right now, that is Hayden Connor. Could change seven months from now. Right now, that's Hayden Connor. Once again, this is a huge year for Quinn Ewers. And I think we need to do everything in our part to make sure he's as comfortable as possible. And one way to do that is making sure he has the best protection possible on the right side. The next battle to me is not really a battle, right? Because we should challenge as Texas fan Steve Sarkeesian to find a way to use four receivers in this offense. He has a million of them, right? They're all super talented. I think he has seven or eight that could come in and contribute right now. We've seen his ability to use four receivers at one time at Alabama. Now, granted, they were all first round picks, but he still was able to use them all at one time at Alabama. So they say the slot position is between Silas Bolden and Jonte Cook. And Jonte Cook obviously has a leg up because Silas Bolden will not be participating with the Texas Longhorns in spring ball. Also, you know, Jonte Cook has been in the system for a full year, so he should have the advantage in terms of the terminology, knowing where to line up, knowing where to be, and knowing what Steve Sarkeesian wants to accomplish in terms of his playbook, right? But in terms of on-field production, it's not even close, right? Because Silas Bolden has been a starter and was one of Oregon State's best players last year while Jonte Cook was behind potentially three NFL receivers in Adonai Mitchell, Jordan Whittington, and Xavier Worthy. I think, you know, Jonte Cook is the better all-around receiver, right? He's the more polished all-around receiver, right? And there's a reason that he was a top 40 recruit in the country. But also, Silas Bolden is somebody that can do a little bit of everything on the field, right? And somebody who has a ton of production in the Pac-12. And there's a reason that we brought him in in the transfer portal. 
But to me, this is not a position battle, right? We can argue who will be the starter, right, for the first game of the season or who will get the first snap. But like I said, Steve Sarkeesian should be in a position this year where he's able to utilize four receivers effectively. So I'm not going to say who should win the position battle between Silas Bolden and Jonte Cook, because this year Steve Sarkeesian should validate Silas Bolden's decision to come to the University of Texas. And he should validate Jonte Cook's decision to come to the University of Texas by utilizing at least four receivers in a big role. Right. Four receivers in a big role all season this year. Silas Bolden, Jonte Cook. Uh, Isaiah Bond and Matthew Golden. I just hate saying all their names at the same time. So, like I said, this should not be a position battle because all four of these players should play and they should all have big roles on this football team this season. The next position battle they mentioned is somewhat of the same thing because all three of these players are going to play. Andrew Makuba, Derek Williams, and Michael Taft, right? I think Michael Taft has shown, yeah, he's a walk-on, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, he's white, right? That's what most people would say, like, He's a white DB, but he's shown that he's come in and he's played football at a really high level, right? Like he is one of the best safeties on this football team. And he proved to be one of the best safeties in the Big 12 Conference last year. He was a ball hawk for us. He's very smart, very intelligent on the back end, very sound in his coverage assignments. And he's very sound coming down in the run game, right? And so he's a really good safety for us. He's going to be on the field. Obviously, when you bring in Andrew Makuba in from the transfer portal, what he's been able to do as a three-year starter at Clemson, He's a really good football player. He's going to be on the field. And Derek Williams, as a young player, has shown strides, right? He's shown really good strides. And as a true sophomore, you expect him to be on the field with his instincts and his athleticism to make a lot of plays for you. So I don't see this as a true position battle because we know how much we rotated safeties last year at the position. I think Andrew Makuba, Derek Williams, and Michael Taft will all have huge roles on this football team. And I you know, I just want to say this. I obviously don't mean anything against white people, right? But you know the stigma against white DBs, right? And so that stigma – whether it's true or not, plays a factor into how people evaluate Michael Taft, but it's wrong because Michael Taft is a really good football player. Expect Taft, Makuba, and Derek Williams to all be really good for this football team. And then the last battle they mentioned is the off-ball linebacker between uh, Mo Blackwell and Darion Gallette, right? I think Darion Gallette brings a lot of potential to that position um, in terms of his athleticism, being able to play sideline to sideline, being able to play as a true linebacker, but also playing edge in high school, having, you know, some really good and really useful pass rush moves and pass rush potential that he could bring to this team. And then obviously uh, Mo Blackwell is somebody who, you know, plays bigger than his size. He's a safety converted to linebacker, plays like he's been a linebacker his whole life. Right. And uh, Steven for fanatic perspective calls him game speed because when he's out there, he just makes plays. So I uh, really don't have a ton to say about this one. I think both players would be interesting at that position, Mo Blackwell or Darion Gallet. But I do think we need to start seeing some of these younger players that we've recruited out of high school step up and be big factors on this football team. And I would be excited, really excited if Darion Gallet could step into a big role in just his true sophomore year at the 40 acres. A quick word from our sponsors, and we get into 11 players invited to the NFL Combine and some of my favorite quotes from CDC this past week. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot with FanDuel, the official sports book partner of the National Basketball Association. All right. So 11 players from this Texas Longhorns football team in 2023 have been invited to the NFL Combine. Continue to say it. We continue to get confirmation bias that this was one of the most talented rosters we have ever seen at the 40 acres. And of course, they went out there and did the damn thing on the field. Right. You know, going 12 and two and, uh, you know, making to the college football playoffs. And, you know, if you're a valid, you know, if you're an avid listener, you're probably tired of me saying it. But being 11 yards away from the national championship game and you, know, you just hope that you could continue to build on that moving forward and, the way that we've recruited and the way that this coaching staff has been put together. I have no question in my mind that Texas will continue to, you know, be able to put seasons like this together every year moving forward. So when we look at the 11 players invited to the NFL combine, that's a lot, right? I remember, uh, I think the first year under Sark, only two players got invited, which was uh, Cameron Dicker and Josh Thompson. So two years later for 11 players uh, to be invited is huge, right? And we've talked about how, the record since we've moved to the seven round draft for the Texas Longhorns getting players drafted is seven. 
And I think they have a really good chance to break that this season. So when we look at the 11 players invited, uh, Byron Murphy, all the smoke seems to be like he's going in the first round. He absolutely deserves it. Adonai Mitchell, I think he's late first, early second right now. A strong combine, especially for a player who's not known for his speed or athleticism, could definitely push him into um, you know, the first round if he tests really well. Xavier Worthy, I think he's a lot to go in the second round right now. But, of course, he has that crazy speed. If he comes out and tests that, you know, 433 or, you know, 433 or lower, I definitely think you could see him, you know, pushing to the end of the first round, especially when, you know, we saw teams like Kansas City who really had, you know, only one receiver they could rely on all year. You know, that's a player in Xavier Worthy who obviously, you know, Andy Reid can't drop enough plays for. So depending on how he tests, he could definitely push himself into the first round. Uh, Tavondre Sweat, there's some questions about, you know, his weight, you know, his pass rush potential. So I think he's going to be second or third round, which is still really good. But, you know, based on what he did on tape at the University of Texas this past year, in my eyes, he's probably one of the 15 best players in the draft. And hopefully that shows up in the NFL. Uh, Christian Jones, just <laughs> a success story of development, right, for him and Kyle Flood. Um, just a testament to hard work, right? And betting on yourself and never giving up, you know? And now it seems like he'll be at worst a fourth round pick in the National Football League. And, and I felt like when I interviewed him on the podcast this year, like I asked him, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years? He didn't say anything about the NFL. I don't even think in the middle of this season, like Christian Jones thought that he could be a fourth round pick in the National Football League. When I asked him where he saw himself in 10 years, he talked about being a good brother, you know what I mean? Being a good person, being a good human being, right? He didn't say being a 10-year vet in the National Football League. So it's just a testament to his hard work and his growth and his development. And now he looks like he could have a lengthy career in the National Football League, right? Jalen Ford, um, invited to the combine. Not sure where he'll get drafted, but definitely could provide value to any NFL team at the linebacker position. Jordan Whittington, I think, is one of the more underrated wide receivers in the country. I think he'll have a better NFL career than he had college career. Ryan Watts, definitely an underrated corner. May have to move to safety in the National Football League, but a playmaker nonetheless. Keelan Robinson, right? You know, especially the way that the running back position is devalued, but you're bringing in players like Isaiah Pacheco out of the seventh round to come in and be your starting running back. I think Keenan Robinson can find a role somewhere, right? He's aggressive on special teams. He can make plays in the return game. He can make plays in the running game. He can make plays in the receiving game. I just, you know, have to figure that, you know, even though there is a, a lot of running backs and maybe there's more running backs than we need in the National Football League, somebody will find a place for Keenan Robinson, even if it's on the practice squad, Jatavian Sanders. Um you know, one of the best tight ends uh, coming into the draft. I think probably the consensus number two tight end uh, behind Brock Bowers. He should be drafted in the first couple of rounds. So, you know, like I said, it's crazy going from two years ago where we had two players invited to the combine and neither got drafted to now where we have 11 players invited to the combine. And we should break the record this year for NFL players from the University of Texas selected in a single seven round draft in just three years under Steve Sarkeesian. Crazy stuff. Now getting into some of the comments that CDC made in a press conference he had earlier this week. Four things he said really caught my attention and I want to talk about them on today's show. The first thing he said is we're just going home to the SEC. That's how he characterized the decision of us moving to the SEC. He said we're just going home. I agree and I disagree. I agree because when you look at the quality of games on our schedule last year, right, it sucked, right? Texas needs to be in the SEC, right? A program like Texas should be playing in the biggest games in college football on a weekly basis. When you look at it, we had Alabama last year, right? That was a great game, right? We had Oklahoma last year. That's a great game every year. Outside of that, the other 10 games were meaningless, right? Not meaningless in terms of like, you know, you could win or lose those games and nothing would happen. Like obviously we had to win those games to get to the college football playoffs. But what does BYU mean to Texas? What does Baylor mean to Texas at this point? You know, like Texas Tech, Kansas State, Iowa State. None of those games matter. Like none of those games Texas fans really even cared about. Like we cared about beating these teams on the way out. And of course, Oklahoma State was like the Big 12 championship. But we didn't care about these matchups. Like when we get to the SEC, you're going to be playing Tennessee, LSU, Florida, Arkansas, Texas A&M, Georgia, Alabama. Those games matter. Like every week, those games matter. A program like the University of Texas, a blue blood program like Texas should be playing in matchups like that every week. We should not look at our schedule when it comes out and say, damn, we got two big games this year out of 12. Like our schedule sucked last year. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, we are going home to the SEC where we'll have better matchups. Now, this is where I disagree. Right. Regional rivalries is what makes college football. 
right? We're rivals with Texas A&M because they're the second biggest program in the state, right? We're rivals. We're not necessarily rivals, right? Right. But we all know people who went to Baylor, right? We all know people who went to Texas Tech. We all know people who went to TCU, right? We all know people who went to University of Houston, right? These are our neighbors. These are our coworkers. These are people we rely on for services, you know, in the state of Texas, right? So yeah, we're going home to better matchups in the SEC, but my little sister goes to Baylor. And now, you know, us being an, two hours apart doesn't mean anything. Our schools that we root for being an hour and a half apart doesn't mean anything because we're not in the same conference. We all know people that went to Texas Tech and now we won't have those conversations anymore of Texas playing Texas Tech on a yearly basis. I live in Houston. Now with Texas going to the SEC, Texas and the University of Houston have no, right? Like they don't mean anything to each other at this point when Texas goes to the SEC. So I do think we're going home in terms of better matchups, but I will say that we're leaving home Right. Because so many of the the regional rivalries and, and, and you know, banter and, and things we're able to pass back and forth because we play teams in our area in the state of Texas will be gone when we move to the SEC. Because, like I said, all these Texas Tech alums and Baylor alums and Houston alums and TCU alums, these are our friends, our family, right, our co-workers, people we you know rely on for services. And that's just kind of gone moving forward. Like I said, my sister goes to Baylor. It's an hour and a half away from the University of Texas. And I have no idea when Texas will play Baylor again in a sporting event once they move to the SEC. Lowering ticket prices going into the SEC. I love this, right? Just because we're going into a bigger conference and we're going to have bigger games doesn't mean you should, you should increase the ticket prices. We live in a capitalist society where you have to capital, you know, capitalize on every opportunity and make as much money as you can, right? But just because you can doesn't mean you should. It reminds me of my barber, who's the best barber in the Central Texas area, right? Hans in shirts at Elite Styles Barbershop. When everybody, this was in 2021, the last time I went to him, so he maybe went up by now. But the last, you know, everybody was raising their prices to $40, $50 then for a haircut, right? I paid $40 now for a haircut, and he was still charging 20 even though he could have doubled it to 40 and made the same amount of money, right? But he was like, these people have been supporting me since I was cutting hair in my garage, right? Like, I owe a certain level of loyalty back to my customers. You know what I mean? It's the same thing with CDC. The University of Texas is going to be fine financially, right? They're going to make more money than they can ever spend, right? What they can do to show appreciation and gratitude is show loyalty to the people that they built, you know, this program off the backs of, right? There's going to be 100,000 people strong in DKR every Saturday, regardless of what they charge, right? But doing the right thing is taking care of the consumers who have put you in a position to be the University of Texas and have one of the biggest brands in the world. And that's lowering ticket prices for your base. Definitely love that by the University of Texas um, going into the SEC. Grass field by 2026, obviously we're tired of turf. We're tired of seeing what turf does to the players. Every player you've ever heard talked about it says they prefer natural grass. And I can't wait to see natural grass in DKR in 2026. Great move by uh, the administration. And then inquiring about Oklahoma, Texas moving to 230. Leave it at 11. The, the best part about college football is the tradition, right? The tradition, um, the history. And that game has been 11 since I've been alive. Right? That game is at 11 every year. And be honest, like, yes, you know, you probably want to get a later start to your tailgating, right? You don't want to have to wake up at 5, 6 to plan to get drunk and drive to the fair and find parking and get in the game by 11. I get that. But as a college football fan, be honest. The best games are at 11 or at 7. Nobody wants to play at 2.30, right? You either want to get your game out the way and watch your game as soon as college football starts, or you want the primetime game at night. Nobody cares about the 2.30 games, right? You know what I mean? Unless it's like Alabama, Georgia, and even then it still doesn't feel right. 11, 7, or bust. Leave it at 11. It's been that way forever. We talk about it being one of the best robberies in football, and what makes it one of the best robberies in football is the tradition in the history. And part of that tradition in history is that game kicking off every year as soon as college football starts on the second Saturday in October. Thank you for tuning in. Excuse me. We're not done. Right. We got two more topics. So, yes. Quick word from our sponsors. And then we're talking about NCAA 25 and the Texas basketball team tomorrow. Sorry about that. Today's episode of Locked on Longhorns is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. See the view from your seat before you buy so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All in prices show your total or print so you know you're getting a great deal before you check out. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event. 
And even an hour after it starts, it's the place to find last minute seats, find exclusive flash deals and sponsor deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Right now, all game time users get $100 off a big game ticket with code Vegas100. Terms apply. Just download the game time app and use code Vegas100 for $100 off a big game ticket. Or if you're not going to that game, then use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices. Guaranteed. See. All right, I'm trying to do two topics in the next five minutes. Uh, the first thing is the NCAA video game uh, returns after a decade plus hiatus. It will be returning uh, this summer. I think uh, full trailer come out in May or like full game t- details will come out in May. I think the game will either drop in June or July. So I got to thinking like who would be the best players of the SARP era on the NCAA video game. Right. If it had released or it had been out, you know, the whole time. Right. And I came up with like seven players I want to mention. Right. I think first, obviously, is B. John Robinson. He'd probably be a 97 to 99 on the game. Really has no weaknesses in his game, especially at the college level. Right. You're talking about speed, quickness, burst, burst, ability to make people miss. Right. Pass blocking. Right. Ability to catch, ability to run routes. And of course, I mean, the running game, everything associated with that would be a 99. So B. J. Robinson, one of the best players we've ever seen at the 40 acres, one of the best running backs we've ever seen in college football. Uh, the only reason I don't have him as a 99, because Johnny Manziel, you know, after a Heisman was 97 in the last NCAA game. So um, I got him at 97 to 99, but unquestionably, he would be the best player on the game we've had thus far in the Steve Sarkeesian era. Number two is Xavier Worth. I got him at his 95 to 97 overall. The reason is because you know how speed works on these video games, right? And every speed attribute Xavier Worthy has would be 95 plus at least, right? Plus he scored 26 touchdowns in three seasons. So he's still a really good receiver on top of that. So I just think in terms of the speed, what he was able to do at the receiver position, how you would have to rate him and just put damn near everything at, at 95 plus because he was so explosive. I think Xavier Worthy would be a 95 to 97 on the game. And he definitely was one of the best uh, receivers in college football the last three years. So this one, you know, you would probably have to update throughout the season. I'm not sure if he would have been a 95 coming into this year, but he definitely earned a 95 throughout the season. That's Tavondre Sweat, right? All-American, um, Outland Trophy winner, uh, you know, best defensive player in the conference in the Big 12. And if he didn't get, get that award, he probably would have won Big 12 Defensive Lineman of the Year. But I'm happy that Byron Murphy got that one. But um, just one of the best players in college football this year, regardless of the position and Every time you turned on a Texas football game, he jumped off your screen, right? And he had a strong uh, performance the last few days at the Senior Bowl. So, uh, Tavondre Sweat's going to make a lot of money in the National Football League. But in terms of on the game, he would have been a <laughs> disruptive force, right? He would have been the best player on your defense. I'd say Tavondre Sweat would have been a 95 overall in the NCAA video game. Kelvin Banks a 95, right? I say all the time, the most important positions in football, the quarterback, the person that protects the quarterback's blind side. Quinn Ewers is right-handed, so that makes Kelvin Banks that player. And then the edge player, right, that's trying to disrupt the offense and get the quarterback on the ground, right? And Kelvin Banks has proven himself from day one as a starter, right, as a true freshman to be one of the best left tackles in the country. I absolutely expect him to be a top 10 pick in next year's National Football League draft. And if they're able to rate offensive line play correctly, Right. Then Kelvin Banks should at least be a 95 on the NCAA video game. So I would have him at number four. At number five, I have it tied with Adonai Mitchell and Byron Murphy. Adonai Mitchell, one of the best receivers we've seen over the last three years in college football, especially in the biggest games, five touchdowns and five college football playoff games. That might never be breaking (laughs) broken. Right. That like that might never be done again. Right. And we kind of just talk about it like it's normal. Seriously, like there might never be another player in college football history to score five touchdowns or score a touchdown in every college football playoff game they play. Well, I guess you could play only one. Yeah. There will never be another player in college football history to play at least five college football playoff games and score in all five of them. Right. If I'm wrong, come back and find me. But yeah, I don't think that's ever happening again. And then Byron Murphy, like I said, you know, should be a first round pick. One of the best defensive linemen in the country this year, best defensive lineman in the big 12 conference outside of Tavondre Sweat. I think both of those players would have been a 93 to 94 overall. My honorable mention is Jalen Ford, because based on the 2022 season, he had one of the best defensive seasons we've ever seen at the 40 acres. I think he would have been a 92 to 94 overall coming into the season. Maybe they would have updated and dropped him a little bit. I don't know. But you're talking about somebody last year who had 100 tackles, four sacks, four interceptions, like two forced fumbles. He went absolutely insane, right, and was snubbed for Defensive Player of the Year in the conference. So I think if Jalen Ford was on the game coming into this year, there's no way you could rate him at lower than a 92. So I just want to give him honorable mention for that 2022 season because it was special.
All right. Keys to Texas basketball game, their biggest win of the season tomorrow and beating Houston in Houston. Here we go. My five keys. The first one is you have to start off fast, limit the crowd, put the pressure back on U of H. If that crowd gets to jump in because U of H jumps on you earlier, you or do not have a chance. Right? That's a raucous environment. And you, you do not want to spend the entire game trying to catch up to U of H, right? Trying to bridge the gap between what you're down by U of H, right? You want that to be a close game the entire time or you want to be in the lead the entire time and put that pressure back on U of H right in front of their home crowd. But if they get out to a fast start and like Texas has been in most of the recent games, you get down early, get down 10 points early. You're not going to catch up to this UH team. They rebound too well. They defend too well and they have too much of a home court advantage. So you have to start off fast, put the pressure back on U of H and take the lead early or stay in the game throughout the entire game and have a chance to win it at the end. But you cannot be down to this UH team and spend the entire 40 minutes trying to catch back up to them and make it a game. You will not win this game on the road against the University of Houston. Four players in double figures at minimum to win this game, right? I think that's what it's going to take. I think four players have to be in double figures. Four players have to score at least 10 points for you to win this game. Hopefully it's your big four and Dylan Mitchell, Tyrese Hunter, Dylan DeSue, and Max A. Smith, but whoever it is, right? I think you need four players to score in double figures to have a chance to win this game. Two of those players have to be Max A. Smith and Dylan DeSue, right? The way that this roster is constructed, we cannot go out and win games, especially big games, without Max A. Smith and Dylan DeSue showing up. I think they have to combine for 40-plus points. And if you get four players in double figures, that's at least 60-plus points right there, right? I don't think you're going to score more than 75 points against this University of Houston basketball team on the road, right? So if Max Aceman and Dylan DeSue can give you 40 plus, two more players can give you 10 plus, that's 60 right there. You can figure out the rest of the 10 to 15, right? But Texas will not win this game if Max Aceman and Dylan DeSue don't have a great game. Maybe it doesn't have to be 40 plus, maybe it can be 39, but you get my gist, right? They have to go off tomorrow for Texas to have a chance. You have to be competitive on the boards, right? That's the main reason that you lost the last game. Uh, Houston is one of the best rebounded teams in the country and they attack the boards really, really hard, right? And so Dylan Mitchell and Dylan DeSue are going to have to find a way to win that matchup down there in, in the boards, right? Because you can't allow a team like Houston, who's already more talented than you, already more sound than you, to out-rebound you and have 10 to 11 more opportunities than you, right? You're not going to win that game. So, you know, I know it's going to be hard, right? I know Houston rebounds their ass off, you know, for sure. But, you know, Texas is going to have to find a way to at least stay competitive with them on the boards. Because if you get out-rebounded by double digits in this game, you're not going to win this game. And then the last one, I don't know what this looks like, but it just has to be done. Rodney Terry has to outcoach Kelvin Sampson, right? Whether that's by rotations, whether that's by substitutions, whether that's by who's guarding who, whether that's by timely timeouts. I don't know, <laughs> you know, adjustments, whatever. Like I'm not a coach. I don't know what Rodney Terry outcoaching Kelvin Sampson looks like. I just know he has to do it for Texas to win this game. So biggest game of the season for the Texas Longhorns, in my opinion, because they're on the bubble. It's a must win game for the Texas Longhorns. And obviously if they win it, it would be the biggest win of the season for the Texas Longhorns tomorrow. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Locked on Longhorns, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hook them. Peace. Have a blessed weekend.